Just because I'm discussing violence and have a bias on it, does not mean I condone it. This video's content about violence is for educational purposes. It is not meant to be looked at as a means to further violence. There seems to be a common misconception that, just because you use violence, your cause is suddenly less noble. That, if you aren't pulling a Martin Luther King Jr. or a Gandhi, why bother? And while I could go over why such nonviolent forms of protest are ineffective, that is for another video. In this video, however, I'm going over political violence, specifically the difference between left and right wing extremist violence. First of all, violence will always be part of politics, because it's not about whether or not you use violence, but instead who you permit to use it. For an authoritarian, this might be the police or the state. For anarchists, this would be protesters, militias, and the like. No matter if it's consciously or not, yours and everyone else's politics permit the use of violence to some group or peoples that are preferred. The details of political violence can vary based on political affiliation. Right-wing extremist violence goes after groups of people whom have characteristics that cannot be changed. This can include LGBTQ people, ethnic minorities, and women. It should be said that the reason such people are targeted is because of fascism. Characteristically, fascism will firstly target non-whites. Some examples of this targeting of non-whites includes the Trail of Tears, putting Japanese Americans and Mexican asylum seekers in concentration camps, and the discriminate incarceration of people of color. After such non-white specific violence, fascists then move on to LGBTQ plus people. The Lavender Scare and shaming of homosexuals under Nazi Germany are examples of this. While the toll of right-wing violence is more than I can go over in this video, the more general metric I want to look at here is lethality. I've already said in previous videos that right-wing extremist violence has accounted for around two-thirds of all extremist fatalities in the United States. But what's even more interesting is that, in 2018, the far-right accounted for all extremist fatalities in the US. And that really goes over the two problems of right-wing extremist violence. High fatalities and their tendency to go after groups with characteristics they cannot change. Now, at this point, you've probably heard of left-wing extremist violence because of Antifa, and that seems to have turned a lot of people off from the left because they instantly equivocate their violence with the right-wing, trying to make the claim that if right-wing violence is bad, then left-wing violence is just as bad, right? Well, not exactly. As I said before, all politics use violence in one way or another. It's the characteristics of said violence that are important. Firstly, let's go over fatalities. If we go to the graph I showed earlier, we can see that the left made up 3% of all fatalities in the same time period, meaning that left-wing extremist violence had a fatality rate of almost 24 times less than right-wing extremist violence. The other characteristic that makes left-wing violence different is who they go after. Unlike extremist right-wing violence, leftist violence goes after groups of people for characteristics they can change, such as bigoted or fascist rhetoric and placement on the capitalist hierarchy. Additionally, leftist violence is usually used as a defense against right-wing violence that is being used as an offense. For instance, Antifa saved the lives of many people, including some religious figures, during Unite the Right in Charlottesville. Anyways, it's about time I make a part 2 to my video, Left vs. Right-Wing Extremist Violence. Some of you didn't seem to like the first part. Now what I've said since 2019 has become more obvious recently in 2020, this is exactly what I will be going over in this video. In part 1, the main point I wanted to make was about how all politics are in some form about violence, and that the immensely lethal violence of the right does not compare to the more protective violence of the left. That video happened to be a bit more controversial than the other content I was uploading at the time, which I assume is because it was harder for people to believe my points back in 2019 when I posted the video. Now being in the 2020s, the decade where all the quiet things are said out loud, I'd like to highlight the rhetoric of the far right as of recent that has made my points in part 1 just that much more obvious. If it was hard for people to believe that the far right could be more lethal than the far left, I think it is only appropriate that we go over what the different sides think about violence. You see, when a right winger has access to a means for violence, their thoughts usually tend to veer towards fantasies of vigilantism and killing their political opponents. This has become very obvious in an infamous Turning Point USA convention where one of the viewers asked a pretty ballsy question of the presenter, Charlie Kirk. But I want to ask you something a little bit out of the ordinary. So, prepare yourself. <laughs> At this point, we're living under a corporate and medical fascism. This is tyranny. When do we get to use the guns? No, and I'm, and, I, and I'm not, that's not a joke. I'm not saying it like that. I mean, literally, where's the line? How many elections are they going to steal before we kill these people? So, well, no. 
Now, Charlie Kirk walks his back. Obviously, as a political grifter, he has to, or else he threatens legal action or getting on a government watch list or some shit like that. Notice, however, the way he walks his back, saying that aggression is something the left wants right-wingers to do to make them look bad. I find this point absolutely hilarious, because what's really happening is entirely contrary to this point. It is not the left trying to agitate the right to make them look bad. Moreover, the recent politics of the right has been formed in a way to get the right wing angry. They're more politically invested that way, and when they're more politically invested, they play very neatly into the hands of grifters who want to make money or gain power off of the QAnon movement, the far right, the three percenters, etc, etc. Now, I don't personally believe that Charlie Kirk pushes violence as much as some of his other right-wing counterparts, but they do play on the same team, and he's doing public damage control in this interview. His purpose, at least at that moment, was to clean up his colleague's mess. Unsuccessfully, of course. Nobody, not that I know of, is buying his backtracking rhetoric in that clip. So, what do I mean when I say the far right has been pushing a more aggressive and anger-inducing agenda? Well, firstly, there was the focus on the Kyle Rittenhouse trial. I'm not going to go over the exact details for the sake of brevity, but Kyle Rittenhouse was a teenager who had killed multiple people with a rifle he brought over state lines, claiming self-defense being the reason for his murder. A lot of the right at the time was watching the case intently, hiding behind the thin veneer of being pro-Second Amendment, which I imagine some believed in good faith, but considering what I've seen of the far right's violence, this smelled more like coded language given to them by more extreme right-wingers to develop a good-faith-sounding argument to cover for Rittenhouse's activities. When Rittenhouse was eventually found innocent on all charges, users on the right-wing forum thedonald.win found it as a precedent to kill without consequences. Meanwhile, the Proud Boys called for stacking up bodies like cordwood after the verdict. There were even right-wingers outside a courthouse cosplaying as Rittenhouse not too long after the verdict as well. These violent actions are not outliers provoked by the ruling, though. If anything, they are the norm. One far-right group called the Three Percenters was infiltrated by a journalist who reported that they were asked if they would be willing to kill people from Antifa and BLM in their intake interview. While there are infiltrators and plenty of evidence to prove these groups are preparing to commit premeditated murder, don't hold your breath in regards to these groups being cracked down on by American law enforcement, as they too are in on the violence. One report from NPR claims that the police have been found on the rosters of a far-right group called the Oath Keepers. I also mentioned in my video on police that they've been investigated in the past by the FBI for white nationalists infiltrating their ranks, whom they've nicknamed Ghost Skins. Clearly, their efforts have not had an effect on the clear far-right biases of the police in America. Now, this kind of violence isn't just exclusive to America. In Canada, a QAnon influencer, Romana Dedulo, has declared herself as the Queen of Canada, instructing her 70,000 followers to go duck hunting, which is code meaning healthcare workers, politicians, and journalists. The groups are either doing some serious LARPing or are getting more serious about their agenda, with followers embracing a flag to symbolize their queen, along with photos of firearms being shared, some followers even claiming they would be more than happy to quarter these duck hunters. I've focused a lot on the right here, but I imagine that leaves some people asking, what has the radical left done during these times? Surely they can't be that tame, right? Well, the largest left-wing firearms organization, the Socialist Rifle Association, has a subreddit where a particular post made after the Rittenhouse verdict was embraced quite heavily. The post said, we are not a militia, which is quite the opposite of the right's reaction to this verdict. Many on this SRA subreddit are claiming that, while they did get guns after this verdict, it was for self-defense as they feel more threatened by the rise of far-right extremism. Keep this in mind. When the left gets firearms, it's for protective force. When the right gets firearms, it's for offensive force. Many leftists in these recent years have been talking about not only past revolutions, but what the patterns of revolution are. Since America has become an unstable tinderbox waiting to be lit, people are anticipating more systematically changing and radical action to be on the horizon. And I want to end you with this. America has had a growing population of people who have become disillusioned with the electoral system in this country. I can't blame them. They've realized more over time that this country is a de facto aristocracy. However, this loss of faith within the two-party system has only temporarily led people to depressive inaction. It has instead birthed the likes of many vigilantes. The high-stakes events of the Rittenhouse trial, the modern BLM movement, the COVID pandemic, and so on, have led for the match of vigilantism to be lit. It will soon touch the tinderbox that is America, and from there, we have some very interesting events to witness unfold.